It's interesting how art and history can have an impact on warfare. This is the story of a museum curator tasked with the development and creation of an American combat helmet. From the earliest days of American involvement in World War I, the mission to create and test experimental helmets fell to Bashford Dean. Born in 1867, Dean was a noted zoologist, author, and was the curator of the Arms and Armor Department of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. In 1917, the War Department contacted Dean and congratulated him on being appointed to the rank of major in the U.S. Army Ordnance Department. Dean's position at the museum and his knowledge of historical armor made him an ideal person to coordinate and design experimental helmets for the U.S. military. Dean immediately looked towards foreign helmets currently being used or being tested. This included experimental designs such as the French Adrian equipped with the Pollock visor. While some of the designs considered were extremely functional, some were downright ridiculous, but no ideas were excluded. Of approximately 16 experimental designs considered and created by the Armor Department, four were given serious consideration to become the first unique American combat helmet. The Experimental Model II, developed in June 1917, featured classic designs of 15th century Greece and was pressed from Hadfield manganese. The helmet provided vastly more protection than did the M1917 helmet. Approximately 2,000 Model IIs were produced by Ford & Company in Philadelphia in the fall of 1918. The suspension of the Experimental Model II was copied from the German M1916. Three leather pads provided the cushion. The chin strap was also an improvement as it was independently attached and made from a web canvas. As great an improvement as this helmet was in comparison to the M1917, it was rejected because its shape was considered too similar to the German helmet. Another design greatly influenced by the German helmet was the Experimental Model 5. Weighing in at 2 pounds 12 ounces, it too was deeper and provided better protection than the M1917. The Model 5 was produced by Hale & Kilborn, a company from Philadelphia. It was made from Hadfield manganese but was far more difficult to press than the M1917 as it required four draws of the steel press. Like the Model 2, the Model 5 suspension was similar to the German helmet and was constructed primarily of leather. The helmet also relied on a leather chin strap. Again, its similarities to the German helmet ultimately prevented it from being adopted. An excellent example of this is this photo showing a group of American soldiers. A close look, however, reveals what appears to be a German soldier. Actually, it's an American officer testing a Model 5. This World War I staged photo of two American soldiers, one wearing the Experimental 5 and the one with the rifle wearing a German helmet, show just how similar these designs were. The fierce appearance of the Experimental Model 8 with its steel visor made for a distinctive and attractive helmet. Ford produced 1,300 near the end of the war for testing. The helmet could be worn with a visor up or down. It was painted olive drab and coated with a fine mist of sawdust like the M1917. While it was a sturdy, well-built helmet, it wasn't really practical and it received little interest from the Army. It was eventually discarded. Another very interesting design was the Model 6. This helmet had a tilting dome which could serve as a face shield. Apparently only one was produced by Bashford Dean's team of designers. Dean and his team clearly looked at helmets from history's past. The Model 7 was a three-piece steel helmet made in three weights weighing from 11 to 16 pounds. Designed for machine gunners, approximately 50 were produced and tested, but they were absolutely impractical. This photo shows the experimental Model 9. Like the Model 7, it was clearly too heavy and cumbersome for actual combat use. Apparently only one example was produced. The experimental helmet that nearly replaced the M1917 was designated the Liberty Bell. In 1918, the helmet was provisionally adopted as evidenced by articles in Stars and Stripes. Several examples were produced, some with leather chin straps and some with canvas webbing. Several different suspensions were tested, including the M1917 style and the three-pad leather suspension. What prevented the helmet from being adopted wasn't any particular fatal flaw, but the fact that American soldiers just hated its appearance. Even in 1918, the Army realized that if a piece of equipment wasn't accepted by the Doughboys, they wouldn't wear it. The idea of replacing the M1917 with the Liberty Bell was abandoned. Bashford Dean and his team never did produce a design that would be used by American forces, but his helmet designs helped propel the U.S. military forward. Dean went on to write helmets and body armor in modern warfare, the premier reference for information on helmets in the early days of the 20th century. 
He died in 1928 at age 61. When World War I ended in November 1918, the American military continued to use the M1917 helmet as the standard issue. On several occasions in the 1920s and 30s, the Army dusted off Bashford Dean's designs in an attempt to find something suitable to replace the ill-fitting, borrowed British design. In 1936, the Army once again decided to improve the American combat helmet. The design that had the best shot of replacing the M1917 was the Experimental Model 5A, a derivative design of Bashford Dean's Model 5. This modified design was deeper than its predecessor and provided better protection to the soldier and fit much better than the M1917 thanks to an improved four-leaf leather suspension designed in the 1930s. The Model 5A featured a webbed chin strap independently fastened to the helmet shell. However, history repeated itself and the Model 5A design was declared unsuitable due to its close resemblance to the German combat helmet. So what did the Army do? It retrofitted the M1917 helmet with the four-leaf leather suspension used in the Experimental Model 5, added a webbed chin strap and installed it into an M1917 helmet and called the new design the M1917A1. The M1917A1 suspension was an improvement over its predecessor. The suspension was installed with a screw at the crown of the helmet so it could be replaced or repaired if damaged. The chin straps were also sewn to the chin strap loops, which were now part of the suspension. Most of the M1917A1 helmets were simply World War I M1917s that had been upgraded. The M1917A1 was used by all members of the U.S. Armed Forces from 1936 until 1942. That's when it was replaced by the famous M1 helmet. From the moment the U.S. entered World War I in 1917, the U.S. military truly wanted a unique and distinctive American combat helmet. Many experimental and prototype designs were created, but they were all rejected for a myriad of reasons. In the 1930s, some of these experimental patterns resurfaced, but once again they were turned down. One idea that had persisted from the 1920s, however, was that of a two-part helmet, a liner system that would fit inside of a steel helmet shell. In 1940, Secretary of War Patterson made the decision not to order additional M1917A1s. This cleared the way for the development and the design of the most famous of all American helmets, the M1. In August 1940, after two decades of foot dragging and indecision, Assistant Secretary of War Robert Patterson finally put his foot down and refused to sign an order for additional M1917A1 helmets. Patterson realized the World War I design was obsolete and ordered the Army's Infantry Test Board to design a new helmet. The assignment for the new helmet fell to Major Harold Sydenham, who worked in the Infantry Board's test section, formerly known as the Department of Experiments. Stationed at Fort Benning with his wife Zelma and young child, Sydenham was known as an innovator for his support of a two-part combat helmet. The M1917A1 and M1917 helmets provided sufficient cover to the crown of a soldier's head, but left far too much of the back of the head and sides exposed. Sydenham reviewed Bashford Dean's experimental helmets and determined that the crown of an M1917 style helmet, coupled with the side and rear protection of an experimental 5A, could be the answer. Under the direction of Sydenham, apparently an M1917 and an experimental Model 5A were taken to a metal shop on Fort Benning. The helmet shells were dissected and the appropriate parts were welded together as you can clearly see in this rare example and then pounded into shape. The design was designated the TS-1 for Test Section Experimental Model 1. 